Father, we thank you so much uh, for coming to your house today. But now we need your to lead us as we look at Scripture and as we say goodbye to 2023, as we say hello to 2024. Uh, just think about Jacob's statement. How can I let you go unless you bless me? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, my boys are in the season of love, and it's not Valentine's, but that doesn't matter because they found love in all sorts of calendar places. But uh, anyway, one of them is engaged. One of them is uh, he's getting ready to do that next step. And uh, one of my boys shared with me, you know, I shared with him, it says, uh, you obviously need to ask the Father's hand, uh, permission for a blessing, actually not permission, a blessing from uh, the parents before you would ask their daughter to marry you. Oh, okay, it's a little bit better. Okay. So, yes, um, my son, he really <clears throat> took me seriously. And uh, so he shared with me some of the things that he had on his list of reasons why they should give his blessing. I'm going to share a little bit of that with you as we get ready for a sermon. But uh, here, here we go. Proofs why parents, her parents should bless the marriage. Number one, they are spiritually united and share similar goals. I thought, well, that's pretty good. It kind of reminds me of don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And so being on the same page, that's, that's a great place to be according to the Scripture. Um, a good start towards moving towards the oneness that God designed that marriage should be. Secondly, he said he was ready for a lifelong commitment. Wow, commitment. Well, that's a word that's not used a whole lot today. And uh, I thought about Hebrews 13, verse 5. I will never leave you nor forsake you. God's ready for a lifelong commitment to you. He already has demonstrated it. Um, are you ready for a lifelong commitment to him? We think about Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. The Lord your God is with you wherever you may go. Wow. So you're never alone. God never leaves you. You are always in the presence of God. And number three, he said, my core values and dreams align. And I thought about uh, Amos 3.3, 3, can two walk together lest they be agreed? And so they're in agreement on the core values and dreams. And number four, he said, I'm financially able to take care of uh, their daughter. And I thought about Jesus' promise that uh, he's debt-free. He said, I've got a dependable job. But Philippians 4.19, my God will supply for all of your needs according to his riches and glory. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or the children begging bread. And there's other texts we could throw in too. God is our provider in every situation, not just financial, emotional, and the other challenges that we face as we go through life. Number four, uh, number five, he says, well, I'm not perfect. Uh, I've been open and honest about my flaws with their daughter and he has become a better man with God and with their daughter. Transparency and growth. I thought about 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, right? This, our covenant relationship with God, <clears throat> God invites us to continue in our growth in our relationship with him. Number six, they, they work together as a team really well. And he gave a lot of great illustrations of how when he started a project, she'd come right in beside him and they'd be working together. She'd do something, he'd go help her. And, and there are some great examples that they were sharing. It's like, wow, you guys are working well. I thought about two is better than one because there's a better return for their labor. The Bible talks about that. And number six, they worked, okay, number seven, they are frequently open and honest in their communication, even if it's uncomfortable. And I put Colossians 3.16, and I don't have time to look it up, and it's not in my memory bank, so I can't share it with you. You'd have to look it up on your own. So we agree on biblical roles and responsibilities. Well, it's a major one, major one. They've honest. They, you know, it's kind of interesting. Um, I don't know. They, they even... Looked at divorce, they went through the Bible and they studied it out. And what is that about? What is it allowed for? Um, marriage, all that. They, they got in the Bible and they're dealing with issues and looking for biblical solutions. Very interesting. Not that they're planning on divorcing. That, that's not the issue. <clears throat> but they just want to understand what the Bible says regarding relationships. They've been through a lot of life together. They just get started in a relationship a couple of weeks ago, but they've been through some hard times. And some good times. No, they didn't just get together. <clears throat> it's been a year plus and, uh, and still going strong. So in light of uh, <clears throat> what they are doing to prepare to make a lifelong covenant in a marriage, I thought, you know, there's some things about us who are 
being invited, even wooed uh, by God, and pursued to enter into a lifelong covenant with him for eternity. He wants a relationship with us, a covenant with us. And I thought I would look at some of the examples in the Bible this morning as we say goodbye to 23 and we move into 24. Maybe you already have that relationship with God solid. Uh, maybe you haven't completely made that uh, commitment, or maybe you're kind of waffling back and forth. Whatever the case, we can always hope to grow a little bit more through the year ahead. So here's a few thoughts. Uh, number one, being consistent and dedicated in prayer. And looking at Bible heroes, and the hero that I picked on this one here was Daniel. Daniel. There's been some great prayers, there's no question. And Jacob, I mean Moses praying for that. They would get victory over Amalek, and then his arms got tired, and you know, Aaron and her had to hold him up, and there's a victory. That's a one-time deal, right? But Daniel, interesting if you look at Daniel, um, chapter 6, verse 10. It talks about Daniel. He already knew that the king had made a decree that if afraid to anybody else besides the king for 30 days, uh, that their destiny was the lion's den. What did Daniel do? He went home. He opened his windows of his room towards Jerusalem. In other words, he prayed publicly. He didn't hide that. He was committed to God. It wasn't in a closet. He knelt and he prayed three times a day and gave thanks, and it doesn't stop there, as his custom was since early days. Ever since captured Jerusalem, and maybe before that, Daniel was in the custom of praying. Certainly, if you're a good Jew, you would pray at the morning and evening sacrifice for sin at the temple. There's the hour of prayer. But Daniel didn't pray two times a day. He prayed three times a day. And you think about it through the years, through the decades, the most arrogant, proud, boastful king that maybe is among the history of those who ever reigned in the history of humanity, King Nebuchadnezzar. It took 30 years or so, but eventually God got through, and I believe that a lot of that is owed to Daniel and his three friends' prayers. Every day, two to three times a day, praying for Nebuchadnezzar. Satan was probably frustrated to no end that Daniel would keep praying because, because of his prayers, God could do things that, that Satan was frustrated by, and, and Satan was checked in what he could do because of those prayers. I think about Daniel and his consistency in prayers. Even when it was, his life was on the line, forget it. I'd rather talk with God and pay the price than to be without communion with God. There are so many things. You can go through Daniel and just say, how many times did prayer come in? You know, the dream in Daniel chapter 2, he got the dream. The king dreams on his bed. He got the same dream and its interpretation. Daniel 6, he got the interpretation of the dream. Daniel, just down the list, he couldn't understand the prophecy of Daniel chapter 8. He prayed and he passed it. God sent his angel Gabriel to explain to him the vision and to give him the prophecy of when the Christ child would be born and when Jerusalem would be destroyed. We're talking major life events. Daniel lived through the transition from one world empire to another. A man of prayer. Unbelievable. We need to be people of prayer. Let me ask you, are you praying consistently? When you go out to eat at a restaurant, do you pray publicly? Even though it might be embarrassing, everybody's like, oh, what are they doing? And you're looking around, it's like, oh man, I'm going to be conspicuous. Do you pray or do you hide it? When you visit somebody, elders, deacons, deaconesses, whoever, do you offer to pray with them? I went to visit somebody who was a non-attender, another church, and I left before I had prayer. It's like, Lord, wow, bad mistake. I should have prayed with him. I go back. We're going to have that opportunity. But, you know, Paul prayed for boldness. God would give him the boldness. He asked for prayers that he would open his mouth boldly and preach the gospel as he should. Prayer. Consistently. Secondly, take time to rest even when life is kind of hectic. I thought about an example. The prime example for me is Jesus. <laughs> uh, Jesus, man, John, Mark chapter 6, verse 31 it says, and, and he said to them, Beside yourselves to a deserted place and rest for a while, for there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. You know, if anybody was ever busy, I think Jesus was the busiest, honestly. Jesus was busy trying to be a, a representation of the love of God and healing, you know, just mopping up operations behind Satan and all the catastrophe he's brought to humanity. Jesus 
is healing people. He's preaching to them. He's encouraging them. He's strengthening them spiritually. He just did a mop-up operations that things are gone south everywhere because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Satan has a little bit of a hold in our life. But Jesus, man, he had to take us on every day. Satan was on his heel every day. But Jesus, even though life was hectic, he went and spent some time with God. Mark 135 says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, Jesus went out. He departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Luke 5.16, So he himself often withdrew to a lonely place, and he prayed. Jesus prayed. He was God in human flesh, yet he was humanity uh, in divinity. He needed the power of God. If Jesus needed it, how much more do we Despite Jesus carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders, literally the whole plan of salvation was on his back and nobody else's. He carried it all. Jesus got the spiritual insight, the replenishment, the resources that he needed through prayer. You think about Jesus, another example of rest. Jesus rested on the storm, the Sea of Galilee. Remember the big storm came up? Jesus was trusting in God, living by faith. And when the disciples said, Lord, why are you sleeping? Wake up. We're going to perish. Remember his words? Jesus said to them, he rebuked them. After he said to the wind and the sea, be, peace be still. And they ceased. He said to them, why are you so afraid? How is it that you have no faith? Jesus rested in God regarding the storms of life through faith in, in God. That God would take care of them. That God had a plan, and that that plan would be implemented, and he didn't worry. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough worry for itself, right? We've been counseled that in chapter 6. How can I be more calm and take time to rest, even when there's a storm swirling all about me? God has everything under control. We don't need to worry. Well, thirdly, there's praising God regardless of the circumstances. And I thought about King David as an example. King David, um, well, he was, life was a lot of chaos there at the front part, remember? Um, he was anointed to be king, and uh, so he was welcome to the palace. He did the various things for the king. The king got jealous of him, and then the king started throwing javelins at him. He got two to 3,000 on his army, and they were on a manhunt to kill the next anointed king of Israel, David. Disregard the prophet Samuel's advice. He killed all the um, priests of Nob, except the one who escaped. This man was insane. Eventually, he lost the spirit of God, and the spirit of Satan took over control of him. And David was on the run. But nevertheless, while he was running from Saul, who wished him dead, he wrote some beautiful psalms. <clears throat> psalms 27, verse 4. One thing I have asked of Jehovah, that will I seek. I may dwell in the house of Jehovah all the days of my life to behold the beauty of Jehovah and inquire in his temple. Psalms 95. Thank you, Mom. For in the day of trouble, he will keep secretly in his pavilion. Do you need a place to be protected? In the covert of his tabernacle will he hide me. He will lift me up upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies around about me. And I will offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises to Jehovah. So David cultivated a habit of praise, irregardless of being on the manhunt. Can you imagine if you were in the crosshairs of the president of the United States and he had all the military at his disposal, and he's coming after you with all the modern technology, and you're running for your life, how would you feel? Would you be praising the Lord? <laughs> David found a time and a way to praise the Lord despite the pressure and circumstances, his life being at risk. Couldn't we learn some lessons from David? Number four, giving generously. We know that God loves a cheerful giver. We look at Jesus, God's example of giving generously. John 3.16 is a most generous example of how much God lavishly gives to us in love. I think of Proverbs 11.25, a generous person will prosper, but, and whoever refreshes others will be refreshed, right? So you say, oh, I can't afford to do that. I'm going to lose out. And it's like, well, 
The same way you're generous to others, you're surprised that around the backside, there's some other generosity coming your way in your time of need, if not even without need. Proverbs 22, 9, He who has a generous eye will be blessed, but he who gives of his bread, for he gives of his bread to the poor. Looking out for the poor. A generous eye. What is your eye focused at? Focused on Christ, hopefully, but do you look in the community? Are you aware of the surroundings and the needs that might be even next door to you at your house? God invites us to do that. And as we do that, our generous eye will be blessed as we give bread to the poor. Boaz was an example. Here comes this Moabite who was under the curse of God because Moab was under the curse and they were not allowed to enter into the tabernacle of God to worship for 10 generations. She's from a cursed people. But here she comes with her mother-in-law, Naomi. And Boaz took pity on her. And Boaz, we look at Ruth chapter 2. Boaz says to Ruth, listen, my daughter, will you not? I don't think anybody else in um, Israel were willing to call her their daughter. She was a pagan. She was an outcast, an outsider. But he called her his daughter. Do not glean at another field, nor go from here, but stay close to the young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap, and go after them. I have, haven't I commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, get vessels from the water that the young men have drawn. Verse 15, And when she arose up to glean, Boaz commanded the young men, saying, Let her glean among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. Also let grain from the bundles fall purposely for her, and leave it that she may glean and do not rebuke her. Wow. So here we see that God, you know, through Boaz, gave generously to her. Boaz was blessed. And because of Boaz, you know, his generosity, I'm not surprised that Boaz finds himself in the lineage of the divine Christ child that we celebrate. How can I give more generously to God of my time, my muscle, my listening ear, listening sometimes people just need to be heard. Do you have the time? Will you take the time to do that? How can I use what God has given to me to be a blessing to others? Sharing consistently. God invites us to share consistently. I think about Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, and not did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. So people would bring things at the apostles' feet, and they would then disperse it to those in need. You know, honestly, I praise God that we have an Adventist community center here, that we're dispersing goods to help people in our community in their need. I praise God for that. There's, not a, lot of, there's a, a lot of Seventh-day churches that don't have that blessing. So I'm thankful for that, and uh, I'm glad we support that. So Barnabas is an example. You know, Barnabas saw the need, and he went and sold some of his property, and he put the money at the disciples' feet to help take care of the widows, because at that time when you made a decision for Christ, you were ostracized from the Jewish community. Your support system for the family was gone. It was you and your family of faith. And the family of faith took care of their widows and their children. You know, sharing consistently, <clears throat> we had a blessed Christmas. We had, um, I don't know how many people we had from one of our churches took us up on our offer to come and home of owners like Elsie and I, um, and we had six or so from, I think, Holton Lake Church came. Nowhere to go. You know, we thought that we would bless them, but are you kidding? We were blessed beyond measure. We still talk about that. They still talk about it. We were blessed by sharing the resources God given us. And they blessed us with their presence and shared their life stories. And we were the bigger takers that received the bigger blessing. Sharing consistently. Number six, always forgiving even when it's hard. You know, Jesus really is the one who models this. He forgave people like adulterers, greedy tax collectors. You think about Zacchaeus, of course. Prostitutes that were caught red-handed and brought into his presence. But more significantly, he forgave people as they were killing him, forgiving people. Luke twenty-two thirty-three says, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death, verse 34. And then he says to Peter, Peter, the rooster will crow this day. 
but you will deny me three times that you know me. God forgave Peter his denying the Lord. How many times have you denied the Lord? Maybe somebody says, is there any Christians here? You know, in a classroom sometimes, uh, if you go to, if you ever go to public university, anybody a Christian here? Especially in science where they, they really want to flaunt evolution. They just want to put Christians in their place. And, um, you know, how many Christians stand up and say, I'm a Christian, sir. I'm a Christian. It's hard sometimes, right? But um, you just think about forgiving people when they have done you wrong. And Jesus did that. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. How can we be more forgiving? Asking God to take away the roots of bitterness. Lastly, number seven, new habits for the new year, making right choices. Right choices consistently over time. I thought about Joseph on this one here. Taken as a young teenager into a foreign land, a pagan land, uh, sold by his brothers into slavery, lots of opportunities to have, so lots of roots of bitterness there. But no, he forgave them. And he chose, when we look at Genesis 39, verse 6, um, when he was tempted by Potiphar's wife, his response was, he's trusted everything to me but you because you are his wife. How can I do this great sin against God? Ever ask yourself that question when you're tempted? Satan's putting all the, you know, you might say the kingdoms of the world. You can have these kingdoms of the world. You can have whatever you want. Just compromise in this one area, and it's all yours. The question is, how can I do this great sin against God? My creator, my redeemer, how can I do this? How can I be the Benedict Arnold to, to God and all that he's done, all the angels and what they've done too? How can we? No, let's not do that. So Joseph in verse chapter 45, verse 45, he talks to his brothers. He says, please come nearer to me. So they came near because they're afraid of Joseph, right? They are afraid. <laughs> their, their brother whom they sold into slavery ends up being the prime minister of Egypt. And now they're in his court. And he sends everybody away. What's he going to do to him now, right? Is now the time when he calls out the execution squad and says, get these guys out of here. They had no regard for my life. I have no regard for their life. Take their lives away. That's not at all what Joseph did. So they came near, and then Joseph said, I am Joseph, your brother whom you sold into Egypt into slavery. Just a reminder, you guys did this, right? That's your response, here's my response. But now do not therefore be grieved in or angry with yourselves that you've even done this thing. For God sent me here before you to preserve life. He didn't even put the burden on them. He says, you know what? Regardless of what you did, it was God who sent me here to save life. God can turn bad things into good things. For these two years, the famine has been in the land, and there are still five to go. God sent me before you to preserve the posterity for you in the earth to save their lives by a great deliverance. You know, in the same way that Joseph was consistent through the years. He was bitterly disappointed when he was put into prison because he would not commit adultery with, with the, uh, his... Um, yeah, with Potiphar's wife. He would not commit adultery, so he should be rewarded, right? He was rewarded, not good for good, but evil for good. But he forgave and he grew from that experience and went on to become the prime minister. Who can you forgive this year? Who's done you wrong? Who can you forgive? What habits, new habits can you make like Joseph made? New habits that diligence to the relationship with God, irregardless of prison, false accusation, stripping you of your honor, of dignity, of a good reputation, whatever it is, taking you away from the homeland, whatever it is. How, who, how can you forgive and how can you maintain that relationship? In closure, I just want to go back to Jacob's prayer as we leave 2023 and go into 2024. The big question is, how can you let go of God? He actually says, how can I let go unless you bless me? Satan's got a lot of temptations in front of you. He offers you this and that. He's giving you everything you want. He'll give you the world. There are people who sold their soul to the devil, and they are now at the top of the charts in the music industry. 
People sold the, sold the devil in other ways, and they're, they're doing well financially. They sold their soul. Are you willing to sell your soul so that you can have what this world offers? Don't forget that it's going to be burned up and consumed by fire pretty soon. Your eternal inheritance that God has given you to live eternally is going to disappear. But hang on. Just ever let go of your hold upon him. How can I let you go unless you put me? This is for communion. And I forget where the guys go and I forget where the girls go. So somebody tell me. So guys go downstairs? Okay. These are up here. All right. And then we'll reconvene and we'll celebrate the table.